Hello, I'm Mali Cecere, and we are here today with Professor Andy Cab of the University of Oslo. Professor Cab and his team have been working with satellite data from the Copernicus Sentinel satellites, and today he will explain a little bit what sort of benefits the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 missions in particular are bringing to him and his team. Professor Cab, what sort of work do you perform at the university, and why do you use Earth observation data? My team and me, we are mainly doing research on cold environments, so these are mountains and polar regions. In these regions, snow and ice, ice on the surface, ice in the ground, they dominate most biological processes, most geomorphologic processes, and eventually also human activities. Mountains, polar regions are very difficult to access, and in some regions it's even harder by political complications. Accurate ground measurements are very important and will be very important, essential for research. But satellites give the large overview, um, they cover the entire Earth. Satellites also allow for measurements that would hardly be feasible on the ground, such as millimeter deformation over entire objects or landscapes. And how do Sentinel data from the Copernicus program come into the picture? Um, for a robust, sustainable application of satellite data, satellite data need to be uh, frequent, long-term and at defined quality. And this is where the Sentinel data come into the game. We, uh, my team and me, we are mostly using um, data from the Copernicus uh, Sentinel-1 radar constellation and the Copernicus Sentinel-2 optical constellation. They deliver data with a frequency of six or five days. So this data comes so frequent that we can do highly standardized, often automatic um, procedures, or processes, analysis that would hardly be achievable with more occasional data. Also, the, this high frequency of Sentinel data allows us to observe um, temporary events, it allows us to better forecast, to even respond to certain developments, and it minimizes the uh, chance that adverse acquisition conditions, such as clouds and Sentinel-2 data, affect our data. Okay, and could you tell us a little bit about your working group and the kind of analysis you do based on satellite data? Our team involves a range from geomatic engineers to numerical modelers. So, for instance, we investigate how um, accurate the geometric quality of uh, Sentinel-2 data is to detect small, tiny changes on the Earth's surface at a reliable level. As an example, a concrete example, for instance, we investigate how elev digital elevation models, so digital elevation information that is used to process Sentinel-2 data, how this information impacts on the geometric precision of the imagery. This is particularly important for mountains, steep mountains and for glaciers, the change, so, which is exactly our research areas. On the other hand, uh, we have numerical modelers that develop and use complex mathematical models to simulate uh, glacier flow, glacier behavior or permafrost change. Altogether, as a team, we try to better understand cryospheric processes. We do that for scientific purposes, we do that uh, for applied purposes, such as geohazards. And how do the Copernicus Sentinels 1 and 2 contribute to the observation of glaciers? Uh, we use uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data in two ways for glacier observation. One is uh, we in investigate, we classify the surfaces, snow and ice surfaces, and the other application is we track ice flow. So we classify uh, snow and ice, that means uh, we track uh, changes in the snow line on glaciers, uh, we track where uh, melt water refreezes on the glaciers, it's an effect especially uh, important over the Arctic or we detect when rain or melt events happen on glaciers. These processes are very important to understand the mass balance of glaciers and to understand how glaciers currently react to climate change and how they would react in the future. So the second uh, type of analysis we do on glaciers is actually uh, tracking ice flow and we're doing that by following, by tracking features in sequences of Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2 data and from that we measure ice flow. Um, we do that uh, to understand how fast glaciers are flowing, where they are flowing, how fast, and we uh, try to find out how this ice velocity is changing. Ice velocity is a, a crucial process in glaciers because it uh, defines or it determines how the snow that accumulates in the upper parts of a glacier flows down and melts again as ice. So by that, that means ice flow is very important to understand how glaciers react to climate change and how they would react in the future. 
we're applying similar techniques also on uh, rock glaciers. We do, on the rock glaciers, we do it within this uh, within an ESA Globe Permafrost project. For the glaciers, we do it within the ESA Climate Change Initiative. Okay, and you also mentioned that you work on geohazards. And how do you use Sentinel data for such studies? Mm. For geohazards, we do, on the one hand, we do analysis very similar to the work I just described on glaciers. For instance, we, we track spectral changes in time series. Uh, for instance, we find out where avalanches went down or where landslides went down. Landslides can be quite easy to detect when they destroy vegetation. On the other hand, we also um, we track uh, motion of the Earth's surface. An example would be, for instance, surface ruptures, the surface motions due to earthquakes, where we see how the surface moves and we can measure the displacement on ground. Um, on the other hand, simply the visual interpretation or rapid visual interpretation of satellite imagery, imagery can be very helpful for hazard management, the disaster management. As an example, we, for instance, follow with glacier lakes and try to find out when the glacier lakes reach a critical level so that it could burst out. Another example would be that uh, some glaciers get instable and they creep or they flow down valley quite fast, several meters a day, called surges. And if these glaciers reach the main valley, they can dam up the rivers, form a lake, and this lake can burst out and send a major flood down valley once the ice dam br um, breaks. These events happen typically at very remote, very remote regions. Nobody's living there, but many people will be affected by the floods because they reach uh, regions further down. So for this type of work, the rapid accessibility of data, and reliable accessibility of data is very important. It's very important that the satellite data are acquired in a systematic way and delivered fast. So, and this is what uh, the Sentinel-1 and 2 data are. Okay, now in your work you combine Sentinel-1 radar data with Sentinel-2 optical data. Why is that? Both the Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, the optical and the radar uh, instruments have very specific advantages and limitations related to the wavelengths they operate in. And many applications are only possible when you combine both uh, sensor types, uh, applications that would never be possible using just one type of sensor. An example, for instance, currently we observe on Svalbard in the European Arctic a lot of glacier instabilities, glacier surges. From Sentinel-2 optical data we can measure the surface, the ice flow very accurately, we can detect uh, crevassing, we can detect um, water that accumulates on the surface. Um, but we can do that only over the summertime because in winter, during the polar night, uh, this data don't work. So we, since satellite remote sensing is almost the only means for environmental monitoring over large areas like the Arctic, we would literally run blind over half of the year and would not know what actually happens on the ground. So this is where the Sentinel-1 radar data come into the game. Sentinel-1, the radar data, they deliver data all year round with the same quality, uh, slightly a different visual content, but also the, uh, the Sentinel-1 radar data offer the possibility to do millimeter, to measure millimeter deformations on the ground. So, and together, so the Sentinel-2 optical data and the Sentinel-1 radar data, radar data, they enable us to understand these glacier instabilities, these searches. They allow us to understand how, if they are actually related to climate change, and they allow us to assess actually impacts from these glacier instabilities. And could you give us a second example as well, please? Um, last year, 2016, there was there happened a, a big glacier collapse, a unique, uh, crazy event, a huge, almost 100 million cubic meter glacier collapse in Tibet, happened in July, and this event was uh, very well documented by Sentinel-2. While investigating images before and after the event, uh, colleagues of mine discovered that the neighbor glacier actually showed similar signs of destabilization, special crevasses, very untypical for glaciers. And then in September, when this happened, we warned the Chinese authorities and we got back the information that almost simultane simultaneously to our warning, actually, the second glacier actually collapsed. But we had no clue how the collapse looked, how big it was, where exactly it happened. So we were keenly waiting on satellite data. The first Sentinel-2 optical images 
image was only available 18 days of the event because at this time of the year, September, TBH and Plateau is covered frequently with dense uh, cloud cover and uh, optical images are useless. So we had to wait 18 days to get a clear optical images image. However, uh, Sentinel-1 took a clear, perfectly useful image already in the next overpath, which was three days after the event. So also here, the combination of optical data and radar data shows very well that the combination can be very helpful for hazard management, disaster management, by reducing massively the response times. So with this um, Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, we have now two sources of uh, robust, reliable, compatible and highly synergistic data that we that we can that are <laughs> actually freely available that we can use for all purposes ranging from research environmental monitoring to operational applications like geohazard management. Well, Professor Cobb, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. It's been extremely interesting. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us as well from ESA's Ezrin Earth Observation Center in Frascati, Italy. We wish you a very pleasant day.